Welcome everyone. Um, we are recording tonight for the Spartanburg County Public Library's YouTube channel. This will be posted in our genealogy playlist. And my name is Charity Routes. I am the Director of Local History for the Spartanburg County Public Library System. And we do a first Monday series, albeit this is the second Monday because last Monday we were closed, uh, from October through June. So uh, look for uh, researching um, freed people of color next month in February. So that's a, gonna be a fun program that I've gotta finish my research on. So come explore that area with me. If, if the African-American was free prior to emancipation, what are the records? But tonight we're gonna talk about deeds and land records. And these are resources that are going to be very similar no matter where you are in the United States. Uh, other countries, your mileage will vary. <laughs> um, in the UK, for instance, deeds and land records are on the national level in each of the, the countries, whereas we're on the state level and actually most states, we're on the county level. So those knowing where to look is half the battle. But we're going to talk about what a deed is and where to find the land records. So, basic definition a deed is the official registration of land ownership recording a grant, purchase, sale, or other transfer of land. Um, there are a number of ways that land can transfer from an owner to a new owner. And so we'll look at a few of those tonight. This Record set is slightly unusual because there are always three copies made of any deed. The owner, so the seller, has a copy, the buyer has a copy, and then there is a copy registered with the court. So in the case of um, courthouse fires, those types of things, floods, famine, you know, et cetera, um, it is highly likely that one of these three copies will survive, and if it is one of the ones in the private hands, they will take it in when there's a call for, hey, we had a fire, we lost our deeds from this period to this period, they may very well trot back in to the courthouse and re-register it. So, it may or may not have burned, because there are extra copies in different people's hands and in different places. So it's always worth asking that question, researching who owned the land back in time. And um, if the courthouse copy isn't in existence for some reason, then checking for one of those other copies of each of those transactions. Um, when you purchase a piece of land now, they do title research and you have to pay title insurance to make sure that the title is clear of any kind of um, debts or issues. And so there is a huge long chain of information going over time. So what are some of the types of land records that you might find? Acquisition is on the left, so purchasing. Disposition or selling is on the right. Um, and I'm not gonna go through these lists twice because there's one thing on each of the lists that's unique. <laughs> and we'll go over that at the beginning and the end. So a pat patent or grant. Um, when we started the colonies in the United States, including South Carolina, we were proprietaries. And um, we have boards proprietors and they are designated land managers who gave out land patents or royal grants. Depends on the time period, it depends on the state. Um, a deed is the instrument or document used to transfer the title or ownership from one person to another. A quit claim was an instrument or document where the grantor releases their rights and interest in the property. Um, possibly it was inherited jointly through a will or um, probate process and testate probate process. And it was often triggered by the death of a widow. Um, so, but it's a term that you don't often see that much today. 
you may have inheritance by will that someone says, I leave my 100 acres, that's this geographic 100 acres, to my son, John. You might have inheritance by intestacy, um, which means they didn't have a will, but probate says this child inherits this. Um, silent inheritance is the one we don't like to deal with very often because that's the one without paperwork. So the silent inheritance is land that changes hands through generations of a family and it's just the oldest son gets it and they never file the papers because they're that caused an expense that they didn't want to spend. But if that land ever goes out of the family, it can cause some major issues. So you may find a court suit where um, for a variety of reasons, the court might be called in to settle a land dispute um, or they award land to someone who is collecting on a debt. So if you owe someone money and can't pay them, they could go to court and say, well, they can't pay me, so they need, you need to sell the land so I can get my money. Um, and sometimes the land is, is in lieu of the money and sometimes they sell it and then the money is distributed to the people who, to whom debts were owed. Um, a division or partition is when land inherited jointly had to be divided. So you have seven children and you've got 100 acres. There, is, there, you know, there are processes for how to divide that 100 acres equitably um, to the seven children. It's not always everybody gets however many acres because some land is more valuable than others depending on mineral rights, water rights, uh, improvements such as houses, those types of things. But division and partition um, will divide it equitably among the heirs. Assignment, um, an heir can assign their interest to someone else. Think of it like a transfer, like you transfer a car title. Um, it could be bounty land that someone earned by serving in the military, and that person is perfectly high, fine with being at home on the, the farm in Virginia, but they have bounty land. So they sign over their certificate of the bounty land to someone else, either an heir, a brother, a nephew, a son, or um, they sell it to someone who wants to move to Tennessee or Ohio or whichever spot the bounty land was being given for that particular conflict at that particular time. And so they assign it to someone else. Um, and typically there's a payment in there somewhere. Oops, sorry. Thought I was getting down my notes here. And then a sheetment. A sheetment is when the government takes land back. You see this more in very early East Coast land records where you don't meet the um, parts of the, the grant per se. Or you see it a lot in federal lands, especially like out in the prairies when you get your 40 acres out there or your 100 acres or 60 acres or whatever the land process is. And you have to be resident on that land for five years and build a house and farm it, clear it, farm it. And if you don't do those three things, then the government takes it back and gives it to somebody else. So um, it's just one of those things that you're going to have to take a look for, and it depends on where you are. But those people out in Nebraska and those federal land states, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, will find achievements a little bit more regularly than we see here in South Carolina at this time. So um, this is an example of a royal grant. Um, this is a grant that Marguerite, Lady Culpepper, is giving on behalf of Thomas Ford Fairfax and Catherine, his wife, proprietors of the Fairfax 
well, northern neck of Virginia, but Fairfax proprietary. And um, buried in this beautiful but somewhat hard to read handwriting, it is land being given to Abraham Goad in Virginia, 1704, in what is now Richmond County, which should not be at all confused with the city of Richmond, which is 90 miles away from there, something like that. Um, so be careful of land names and county names that the county and the city are nowhere close to each other. Well, in the same state, but not that close. So, what can a land record tell us? Why is this important? Location, location, location. One of the things we're doing with our genealogy research is trying to establish that our ancestor was that person with that name living at that time in that place. If we know the ages, if we know the um, how old you had to be to own land or do certain tasks, then you may be able to determine that it that is or is not your Abraham Goat. Abraham Goat is not a particularly popular name, but let me tell you, I've got at least 10 in my family tree of varying generations. A lot of them named for that Abraham Goat, mind you. Um, Dates and time periods of possible moves. You may find someone selling land in one place, buying land in the next place. Possible dates of death, particularly of women, because often the owner of the land, the husband, dies. But because of the wife's dower, you have a wait until the wife dies before that land can be settled. We'll talk a little bit more about how women factor into these records in a minute. Um, the friends, associates, and neighbors, um, Elizabeth Schoen Mill uh, calls this the fan club. And so the people who are chain carriers and who are witnesses and who are the court reporter or clerk of court, who are the judge, that will tell you, and the adjacent property owners, those tell you who the people are who are important to your ancestors and may very well end up being the ancestors of people who marry into your family in subsequent generations. It can tell you the relative wealth or proper poverty. Until we get past the um, industrial revolution, so into the 1800s and closer to the 1900s, a person's primary wealth was the land. Um, their property was their wealth. They were not as often merchants and those types of people who might have lived in a city. They were more likely to have a farm even if they lived in the city. So the acreage can be pretty important. And especially in Western migration, uh, because people were moving west because they wanted land. You can't divide 100 acres between 21 heirs too many generations before nobody can actually feed their family on that acreage. So land is always a good thing to be able to track, trace, and figure out who got it and what did they do with it. Um, sometimes a chain of title will be quoted in um, a deed. The land that Sarah Hunter got from uh, James Hunter, Sarah sold it to Amanda Thornhill or James Kelly, or sometimes you get a little bit more of the story in the deed. Not always, but when you do, you do the genealogy happy dance because it is so helpful. Sometimes you get an occupation. Locally here in Spartanburg, we had um, William Walker, who was the author of Southern Harmony, which was an early shape note hymnal. And once he published that book, he becomes William Walker, comma, A-S-H, author Southern Harmony. 
The problem is he bought the land where his widow was living after his death before he wrote that book. And there were five William Walkers in Spartanburg County at the time. We're still working on that one, but it's a challenge. But sometimes it will differentiate William Walker Plumber, William Walker Farmer, William Walker Esquire, William Walker Lawyer, William Walker Author Southern Mark. Once he, once he starts signing his name that way, it is easy peasy to track him. However, five, five, I say. So, a land record can tell us age. Um, men were typically 25 or more before they first purchased their land. Inheritance could be typically 21. Laws did vary, could be as young as 18, but most laws, it was 21 across the colonies. Again, check in that time period, at that time, for men and for women, what the law actually said. But rule of thumb, that. Witnesses, typically you had to be at least 14 to witness something. Land, uh, land transactions, wills, marriages, etc. Um, again, that will vary time period to time period, but it's at least a rule of thumb to start with. So, a few definitions that will help you out as you go through records. When you go to a library or archive, you may say, hey, what about the deeds? And they may say, well, we have this big book of abstracts. And an abstract is where someone has gone through and done a skeletal summary of the important information in the document. One thing to note with an abstract, what the abstractor thought was important may leave out the very thing that solves your brick wall. So, Use the abstracts as a finding aid, a shortcut to get to what deeds you might be looking for. Um, there are also abstracts of other types of records. So use those as a, as a shortcut and then go look at the actual document when at all possible. A transcript it differs from an abstract because a transcript is verbatim, word for word copy of a document. Whereas the abstract just takes who bought, who sold, who were the witnesses, what was the date, maybe the geographic bounds of the property, but it's going to be a lot less informative. And there may be a lot more in that deed. The grantor is the seller of the property. The grantee is the purchaser of the property. If they do the transaction fee simple, it just means they own it outright. There are no restrictions on the property. A fee tail. There are restrictions on the property placed by a prior owner or agreement. Now, this can happen even in modern days where there's a fee tail where there is conservation easement placed on the property. That this is always going to be farmland recreation land, you're not going to come in and put a factory on this land, you're not going to be coming in and putting uh, condominiums on this land, this land is meant for um, maintaining park and precious green space. Um, there may be other restrictions placed on it, I've seen daddies try to place lots of restrictions on things for their children, some of which are legal, some of which are not legal, and look through the court documents to see where that one turned out. There are two types of land states, state land states, which is the 13 original colonies, plus Maine, Vermont, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Texas, and Hawaii. One of these is not like the others, but um, you know, it is what it is. Um, and then the public land states are the other 30 states. So in the state land states, you're going to be looking for state grants, uh, lords proprietors, colonial plaque, colonial grants, uh, royal grants, those types of things. Public land states, you're gonna wanna go over to the uh, 
Federal uh, Bureau of Land Management and look for those initial records there going from the government to the original owner, and then it will be on the local level following through that. Some things to consider. Deeds vary a little bit, time frame and location. Practices and laws can differ, differ from state to state, just like the federal versus the state land states. You may find your ancestor as a witness, a court official, a surveyor, a chain carrier, as well as the purchaser or seller. Um, you're gonna need to think about dower rights and the age of children. Again, 21 was generally the legal age to own property. Um, dower rights, we'll talk about in a minute. And that there may have been a mortgage or a lien on the property. And so someone else may have some rights to the proceeds of that sale. And those are going to be found in the court records um, because they will come forward and say, but not so fast. You can't sell this until I get my cut. <laughs> so, and here's my mortgage. Um, in the Register of Deeds office, they keep records of who the mortgage errors are on the properties, as well as if there are liens, mechanic liens, or other liens, prop liens on a particular property. So, sometimes we find out some interesting information. Remember when I said sometimes you figure out where somebody moved to? Well, this is 1843, and Robert Rogers is selling to Joseph Allen, and Robert Rogers was, this was being filed in the South Carolina Marion District Court, but Robert Rogers was of the state of Louisiana and on so parish, I have no idea, I'm really butchering it, Ron, sorry. Um, Ron caught in Louisiana. I knew I was gonna have problems with it, um, but, the land is in Marion District in South Carolina. Robert Rogers just inherited or owned it before he moved to Louisiana. So in the mid 1800s, you will see a lot of people back and forth between states buying and selling land or sending the documents with a proxy to do the filing. You will also see um, sometimes land where Clerk Court 1 said so-and-so just registered this, um, this sale of land, but the land is back in South Carolina, so they will mail or courier the documents to the original place. Um, so if you're researching Robert Rogers, you now know where the next place to look for him is in 1843, because you lost track of him in South Carolina. In, for finding land records, you're going to look at the courthouse or county offices level in the United States. Um, it's in the Register of Deeds office. At least that's what we call them here in South Carolina. It's where I, they call them in um, Virginia. Um, some of them have some online access. Many don't, or their online access is limited to maybe the last 50 years. So if you're looking for something older than that, you're going to have to do some digging. You may find light, uh, land records at the library on microfilm. Um, you may also find printed abstracts or transcriptions at the library um, closest to where the land is or the next big regional um, library that has a genealogy center. We have some things for Cherokee and Union counties here in Sartenburg. Um, because we historically covered parts of those counties, and we are the we are open more hours than their genealogy centers and things are. Uh, family search. Family search is a huge benefit in land records, in particular, because Family Search has been microfilming and now digitizing records since 1936. Now, some of those early microfilms are pretty darn lousy. Just saying, the quality is bad, but it's there. 
and often predates a 20th century courthouse disaster. So sometimes you have to take what you can get, but these are now all two and a half million rolls of microfilm have been digitized at Family Search. Not all of them, like two million of them, are available on FamilySearch.org. The other half a million, they're still trying to get their way through all the legal quagmire that um, because they um, didn't future proof those early contracts in 1936 for the internet age. Gee, I wonder why. So, um, but they may be there. Family Search made a concerted effort to go to every county courthouse in this country and many around the world asking for permission to do these preservation microfilm or digitization projects. Some clerks said no, and we're out of luck. Most clerks figured out a way to make that work. And so this is a boon to all of us doing research. So they are not necessarily name indexed at this point. We are lucky to have the images online. So you may have to old school look at the index like you would on a microfilm, an old film strip for those of you old enough to know what a film strip looks like. And you have to go back and forth from the index to find the next piece of it to find the actual document, um, which is what you'd have to do if you went to the courthouse too or to the library and microfilm. But hey, it's digitally online. Spartanburg County up through 1900, is there. State or regional archive or library may have scanned some from their collection. Um, in Virginia, you would look at Library of Virginia. Here in um, South Carolina, you would look at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. And both of those have digital collections that have some records. Not everything, but hey, you got to start somewhere. And it's a multiple step process because you have to find the person in the index, figure out is that the right property, go look at the deed, figure out, oh, who did they buy it from? Oh, okay. And back to the who had the property before them if you're trying to trace a particular property back. So for Spartanburg County, the records are located at the Register of Deeds office at the Spartanburg County Office Building on North Church Street. Currently, construction on the new city county complex is supposed to be starting sometime this spring, I am told. So call ahead before you go, because <laughs> things are going to be changing um, on the ground here. Um, they are in-person and self-service. They do no distance research by email, mail, or phone. We do have a list of local researchers that you can hire to go do document retrieval for deeds, 19th or 20th century deeds, particularly. If we don't have access to it on microfilm, somebody can go down to the courthouse. But it, yeah, we have outside researchers who will do that. They'll also go over to the county courthouse for marriage records, which are also not available by distance research. So um, copies of the pre-1900 deeds are available at the State Archives in Columbia. Kennedy Room has them on microfilm, um, as well as the pre-1785 records for South Carolina. And then, as I said, family search. Deed records are one of those records that are kept forever. Some court records are only mandated to be kept for three years. So some records get thrown away every year. Some records by state law have to be kept. So deeds were fortunate. They're supposed to keep them. If they get lost or damaged, they're supposed to do what they can to contact the people who have that to replace that document. And they might be lucky because three copies were made. Um, another term for it is mean conveyance, which is private owner to private owner. So you may see um, microfilm labeled register of mean conveyance. So if you go down to the uh, register of deeds office, this is a couple of years old, so no guarantees that they haven't rearranged a little bit, but they have this entire wall 
of deed books, and it's not all of them, but it starts with deed book 1A and goes through the shorter um, cabinets on in front are the indexes, and the indexes are cross indexes that they have there. Um, the indexes we have on microfilm are either the grant for the seller indexes or the grantee indexes. So we have to look two places. They have the overall one that um, you look at once. These, at least the ones up to 1919, and I'm not sure it may be all of their indexes are available on the Register of Deeds website. They're a royal pain to actually try to look through, but they're trying. They're really trying to get some stuff online, and um, we're hoping to par partner with them on some additional scanning. Um, stay tuned. It'll take us years. Um, but these indexes will tell you where to look in the big books. The big books are huge. Um, this is some of the 12 and 13 letter. So you start out with 1A. These are 12P, 12Q, and yeah, the first couple you get AA, AAA. -A -A -A. By the third, third or fourth, they just say 3A, 4A, et cetera. Um, and they continue chronologically. Um, and I believe the physical books are still being created, but I'm not absolutely positive on that. I know from age of computers, so really full adapt adapting in the 90s, those may be online primarily. Um, at the beginning of each of those index books, there is an instruction page. These were, if they were in the beginning of the book, they were microfilmed by Family Search. So you can, and this is from one of our microfilms. So you can look at this and read the instructions to the person who was making the index at whatever point, because our index covers 1785 to 1919 in the first index set, and then 1919 to 1956, I believe, in the second index set, and then 1956 to somewhere in the 80s, I think. Um, in the third index set. So it's in chunks and you can figure out whether they followed the instructions or not. There are a number of different companies. R.L. Bryan Company is what a lot of places in South Carolina used, a lot of counties. So your state may have had a different company that was the preferred company for these types of records and indexes. So it may be slightly different. There are some Virginia uh, indexes that make me want to pull my hair out because they don't tell you S what, they just tell you S might be on page 145. And it could be the STs, it could be the SPs, and yeah. But hey, I will take an index over reading through thousands and hundreds and thousands of individual pages. So this is what a physical index page, sub-index pointing to page numbers for the surnames looks like down at the uh, Register of Deeds. And this is what our microfilm direct, in, direct index, which is the, the grant for index, looks like. Um, just a couple things to pay attention to if you were in the uh, last month's programs on wills and estates and probates. Same type of deal with the indexes. It's page 88. This is page 88B. So you have 88A, you have 88B, you could have 88Z, depending on how many documents someone with that last name created in the time that that particular chunk of indexing was being done. They are generally speaking going to be in chronological order. Um, and then most of the time you have the surname on the left and then the grantor or the grantee, those names are divided into uh, chunks of the alphabet, three chunks, and it's literally for finding. It is to make it easier if you know you're looking for Alexander, you're looking in that left-hand column. If you're looking for Catherine, you're looking in that middle column. If you're looking for William, you're looking in the third column of given names. 
and it's just a sorting thing. It's a visual quick identifier how to find what you're looking for. The grantee is just in that grantee column or the grantor if the grantee is the if it's the other index. And then you get the book page year of instrument, i.e. year the deed was executed, and then the year of record. Sometimes this can be 40 years difference, usually a little less, but somebody realizes that, oops, we forgot to file it with the court when we bought it. Oops. And so it gets filed. And then with those, if there's a decent amount of time lapse, I would look at the next few entries because often it's because they're registering the purchase of it because they're about to sell it. <laughs> so when there's a lot of time lapsed, do check around it in the record. Um, and then the number of acres gives you a little bit of a, a hint. Um, and then sometimes you get location clues that it's a lot on Evan Street, or you get um, six and a half acres on the road from Berry's Mill to Spartanburg. But that can help if you know you're looking for property that's on Berry's Mill Road. Um, and so some clues are helpful. Um, this is uh, one of the deeds that was listed on the previous page, that it was uh, deed book 00, page 376 and 1878. You do have to make friends with handwritten documents. Just saying. Um, this is just, again, um, a photo of some of the early deeds, and they are just recorded by the court clerk saving as much paper as they can save because paper was expensive. These books were expensive. You always hope for the clerk with good handwriting. This happens to be a picture of a deed that was filed in Greenville County and a copy was sent to Spartanburg County to be recorded. And that is noted in this deed as you are reading through the text. It says, this is recorded in, the, in Greenville County on such and such a day, a copy was sent to Spartanburg County because one party lived in Spartanburg, one party lived in Greenville, and I can't remember where the land was on this particular document. So, I told you we would talk about some dower rights and some, some ways that women factor into deeds that can be both frustrating and helpful. So, in South Carolina, the dower right of women stayed active as a law for longer than it did in any other state, as far as I know. As far as I know, we were the last one to stop dower right in 1985. Yeah. Now, it was, it was to protect the little lady so she didn't end up on welfare before there was such a thing as welfare. But the one thing it does for us is in South Carolina, it gives us a treasure trove of records because the dower right meant that a woman had one third life interest in any property, real or personal, but not the right to then bequeath that property. But if she is 30 years old when the South dies and she lives to be 90, you got a lot of records in there. Yeah, sometimes the land doesn't change hands until after she dies. And then it goes to the three kids. Well, the heirs of the three kids because she outlived all of them. You know, so you get some interesting stories there. But she does not, did not have the right to that property, but she did have the right to live on that property. She had the right to one third of the income from that property, if, you, if they were renting it out for farmland or whatever. If she remarried, unless the will specified otherwise, she lost the right to that property. So that can also be a trigger for sale of property if the woman remarried. I have one, one deed, 1836, something like that. Um, no children, 
can't connect tree heirs as anything but women with children who are widowed young. But the wife inherited, it did not specify the wife had it lost dower rights when she remarried. She remarried at least twice, if not three times after that. <laughs> they kept going back to Chancery Court and back to Chancery Court and back to Chancery Court because of her potential mismanagement of this property. And the other heirs were worried about their inheritance. Um, not all of the cases are that interesting. <laughs> Most of the time, the will specified one third dower right to my wife. Sometimes it named her, sometimes it didn't. And unless she remarries or dies. Um, remember, for a long time, women could not own property in their own name unless they were a widow, single, or si single and never married with no brothers, no males around them to manage it for the little lady. Um, there are some other circumstances where a woman could own property outside of the, the marriage, um, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Dower rights could be voluntarily relinquished to settle the estate more quickly. And in many times, depending on the value of the land, selling the land at that time and dividing, getting that third in, of the inheritance at the time made sense because she wanted to move west with the kids who were all moving west. So you might find a dower relinquishment then so that she could get the money out of the property. So, but it created paperwork. That's the fun thing about this. Um, so the other thing about dower is any time a husband wanted to sell land, the wife had to be hauled into court, interviewed in a separate room to make sure she was not being coerced into allowing him to sell it, um, that she was okay with him selling it. Doesn't matter whether she had any right to the property other than this one third right as dower because they were really concerned about not having a woman be on the poorhouse. They wanted to make sure that he was not arm twisting her for um, selling the land so that he could then desert her or that he could then drink all of the profit, profit from the land, that type of thing. Um, typically, you're going to find the release of how, the dower immediately following within one to two entries of the land sale. Um, and then there are two, two um, terms that you will sometimes see, fem covert, which is an English common law term that just said that a woman was one person with her husband. He was acting for the both of them. She had no legal identity outside of her husband. And then a femme soul was the woman who was acting on her own, usually due to death, divorce, or abandonment. You do see some female merchants, um, hat makers, uh, uh, dressmakers, um, laundresses, some things where they were earning income um, on their own accord. And they would go put a notice in the paper and say, I'm acting on my own accord. Anything I earn from my business, name of business, cannot be used to pay the debts of my husband, name of husband. Um, and it was a way to keep from having the husband to drink them out of house and home. And the woman could. Divorce was not legal in South Carolina until 1949. So it's the way that she could have income for herself and for her children. Um, so an example of dower release from 1884, Harriet Bethay is releasing dower here, the end of the um, John Robert Bethay's uh, sale of land is up here at the top of the page, and then there's the statement of the clerk of court and the witnesses who appeared and said, we saw this happen, and then 
Harriet Bethay comes in and she says, yes, I, he's, he can certainly sell this. I'm not being coerced about it. Um, yeah. Um, and if this were the original, we would get her signature. But we know that it was her signature and not her mark because it would have said that it was an X for mark if she had not signed it herself. So we know that Harriet was literate, which is not unusual in this particular batch of my family. Um, and again, they are selling this uh, property in 1884, um, John R. Bethay to Louis Bethay. Um, I believe Louis was one of their sons. So of course she was fine with it going to her son, but it could have been a different situation. Um, this one is from Darlington County uh, deed books in 1855. Um, this one is a fun one that I am still finding new things out about. Uh, John Sidney Kelly was selling land to Amanda and Thornhill, and it was being held in trust until her husband, Wiley Thornhill, was dead and his debts were settled. Um, on initial finding of this about a decade ago, I thought it was uh, John Sidney Kelly was her brother from how it was reading. Turns out he's likely to be her brother-in-law because she has two children by the surname Kelly, her two oldest children. And so eventually this land in 1870 couple comes to Amanda from a Mary Kelly who seems to be um, the widow of John Sidney Kelly. But I'm dealing with incredibly, incredibly common names. And so <laughs> I'm still piecing it out. Um, she sold the land, may or may not have been divorced. They may have just declared Wiley Thornhill dead um, because they needed to pick up and move to Georgia where she then died in Macon, Georgia. Um, but you never know. Um, a few key measurements that you're going to see on deeds because every deed has a written description of property and neighbors. Um, and so you, you may find a plat, which is a drawing of the property. Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes you just get the, the text description. Um, a poll perch or rod, those terms can be used interchangeably, equals 16.5 feet, and four rods of 16.5 feet equal one chain, which is 66 feet long, has 100 links of 7.92 inches each. I don't know why 7.92, I know there's probably a reason, and my cousin, the surveyor, would probably be able to tell me. I just haven't asked at the right family gathering yet. A section, and for those of you who are looking at land on the East Coast, you will probably never see this term. This is in the square grid, rectangular, mostly federal land states measurements, but a section equals one square mile and 640 acres. There were 36 sections in a given township range in the final form of the rectangular survey system. When I lived in Topeka, we dealt with sections all the time. On the East Coast, we don't even know what they are because we weren't measured on sections. We drew our acres and sometimes they didn't match up with the neighbors and sometimes they did. So, a lot more information and more definitions are in a fantastic book called Locating Your Roots, Discover Your Ancestors Using Land Records by Patricia Law Hatcher. And that was published in 2016 out in Baltimore, Maryland. We have a copy in the Kennedy Room and you would be welcome to take a look at it or request it from your library. So this is an example of a flat map. Um, and this flat map, um, was 1859 of William Willis here in Spartanburg County. This is the top of the plat map. And it shows the waterway. It shows different lines along the boundaries and names neighbors, indicates some roads. So it can be really helpful. Even if you're looking for neighbors, 
because you know Israel Willis's land was adjacent there. You kind of see where the little houses are. So you kind of figure out where to work. On the bottom of the plat map here, it has additional drawings of additional dwellings of various neighbors. Um, scale and size of houses may or may not be accurate to reality, but they're certainly fun. And um, then there's a text description of the boundaries of the property depicted in the map. This is a little more fanciful and a little more informative than many plat maps. Um, I just asked my colleague Brad for a fun flat map as an example, and this is what he gave me. Um, in 1906, we have, this is a, a city of Spartanburg block, and um, Izzell Street, and um, it's a couple blocks from the library here. Uh, Spartan in, um, I believe, burned. Um, but you get a lot more regular drawing and more architectural kind of surveyor um, layout. And in city blocks, you get a little bit more standard. It's kind of like the quadrants out in um, Kansas because you can lay out a block and it's going to be fairly standard, although this one is on a diagonal there. So, you know, we have hills, we have up and down. I see that there are some things in the chat and okay. Cheryl, what do we have uh, question wise? If you've got questions and you're online, feel free to get them typed in. I'm looking okay. through. Yeah. Okay, so I was gonna say Deborah Clagg has had internet connection problems. So she has asked us to, she, she in the chat, she left us her email address and stuff for us okay. to get in touch with her and give her the YouTube channel yep. and the dates that these, this and the uh, uh, Katie Green program okay. will be on. We okay. Can do that. So I've, I've got that information and I've kept it. But there was another question. Let me just get to it here. Okay. And this is about the dower rights. Um, Yes. A person wanted to know, how do you see the impact? What, uh, If I'm understanding her correctly, is there a way in the research to see how that might have affected the uh, the woman, I guess? I don't know. Maybe you see. Um, I'm trying to think what an example would be, because um, Harriet Bethea is a bad example on that, because they they were they were relatively well off and I believe he outlasted her. Um, I mean, I have seen examples where the woman um, relinquished the dower rights um, in a property um, as part of a probate because she would earn, she would get more out of it. And as I said earlier that she wanted to move out of state with the children when they were moving west. Um, one of the, um, I, I personally have not seen a dower right um, inquiry by the clerk of court that where the woman said, no, I'm being co coerced, but at least it was a step to try to protect the woman from Yeah, the, the just being taken to the cleaners. Work. Yeah. What? I said just being taken to the cleaners, like right. Right. you know, and taking everything away from her. Yeah, and especially because there are situations where her parent or her brother or her uncle might have left property to her, but because she was a femme covert and one in law with her husband. Um, that could say, hey, no, he can't sell this. This is being held in trust. You have to talk to the trustee who is. Um, and so there are times when she could protest. As I said, I, I haven't actually seen that, um, but I know it happened. Um, so, 
I mean, the other thing is, when the woman had no rights to her own money, having a third life right into that house, into that land, is huge. Because it meant that she didn't, um, she didn't lose everything. Now, right. just because somebody in their will says, I'm leaving this, doesn't mean that probate doesn't say, well, you're in debt to your eyebrows. You can't keep this. And I, so, but it was part of the probate process to divide all of that up um, and at least attempt to keep um, the widow and any minor children from becoming wards of the county and wards of okay, the state. Okay, so, fo so a follow-up question to that is, so are there some sort of dower records, just dower records? And if no. so, yep. where are they kept? Okay. Um, at least in South Carolina and Virginia, which are the two states I am most familiar with, they are not separate from deeds and probate. You may see um, dower case challenges in um, equity court in South Carolina. So that's one separate place to check and chancery court in Virginia. Because okay. um, those are the courts that when probate goes sideways, <laughs> that's where that case is taken to. Um, as I said, in the in the chancery court case in Virginia, um, where the woman didn't have to release her dower rights to that property um, when she remarried, um, that case, two separate court cases ended up back in chancery court over the years, um, contesting her management of that property. Um, and to be frank, that property included land as well as enslaved people. So the labor of the enslaved people was contracted out and the money was supposed to then be shared between the four heirs, her as the one third dower heir and then the other three heirs who, who were to inherit the rest of the property plus that third would be divided three ways between them after her death. Okay. Um, so it, it's not a separate set of records per se. And again, in South Carolina, we do have the benefit of up until 1985, if you went to sell your property, um, and you were a woman, you had to relinquish your dower rights before your husband and you could sign the deed. Now, you could sign the deed by that point, but you still had to be hauled off into another room and asked. Um, I have friends uh, here who tell stories about buying and selling land before 1985, and they had lived in other states at that point. And they had moved to South Carolina you know, no problem selling land in Virginia or North Carolina, wherever they were before they moved to South Carolina. And then they had bought the first place and then they were moving to a larger home or a whatever. Um, and first time in their lives, they had to be hauled out of the, the main room where they were signing all the, the Shifo deed papers and um, got interrogated that they were okay with this transaction happening. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 reality have we moved to because this is not <laughs> women's rights at this point yeah and it's just the way it, it just the way the wall didn't get changed in south carolina till later than anybody else okay one last question and this oh. one i don't know that this one has anything to do with our our uh, mm -hmm. program but records for the cherokee lands around the time frame of the Trail of Tears, where can they be found? Um, because at least a chunk of those lands were in what became federal land states, you're going to look at the Federal Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, documents. Um, I don't know how much is in Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, because that was 1830s. And so they were clearing the natives off the land so that they could then expand white settlement into those lands. Um, those are going to be 
um, Bureau of Land Management. Um, and it's also going to depend on what state those lands were in. So um, that's, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm reminded of Judy Russell every time she's asked a major question. Well, it depends. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's, it's going to be the federal government will then be dispersing those lands after that. How they kept the records of what they were taking, I don't know where those records are, but I would dare say they are buried somewhere at the National Archives and Records Administration. Okay, thank you. So All right, that, that looks like- the first place I would check, and I would check at the Atlanta branch of, okay. of NARA, because that would be a record set that is most likely to be on the regional level. And if it's not at the regional level in Atlanta, they can tell you where to look and who to Excellent. contact. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that's that's all the questions and everything. Um, I'm just going to, me personally, I'm just going to say thanks, everybody, for joining us and uh, come back next month. Yes, next month we'll be talking about free people of color. So um, that'll be an interesting dive into some different records Yeah. Um, for me as well as you all. Um, thanks for being here and contact us at kroom at infodepot.org if you have follow-up questions or if you don't hear from us um, by the end of the week with the link for this class being posted, uh, just shoot us an email. Um, we got a lot of moving parts this week, so we'll try to get that <laughs> up and out to you. And uh, sorry if anybody was having um, connection issues, um, but we're glad you came and glad you joined us tonight and look to see you again in the future. Thanks. Okay, are we ready to stop recording? Yes.